evening. Welcome to live chat here at Baker's Green Acres. I am Mark, your host. Uh, tonight is our Wednesday night. Oh, I have a little bit more light behind me than we usually do. That's okay, though. Oh, you sure? Well, I don't know. It seems all right. Our Wednesday night uh, live chat question and answer. Um, this is where it all began. This was the show that we started with. And uh, the idea here is I, I make a couple videos now and again just on things that I'm doing as educational. And then I will get a whole bunch of questions in the, in the, the comments section. And I don't have, I really, I'm not that, you know, I'm more of a verbal communicator than a typing communicator. So uh, we set aside a little bit of time on Wednesday night uh, in order to answer questions. And it seems like a good thing to do. Uh, a lot of people are deciding that they would like to be homesteaders or small farmers or just have a more sufficient, self-sufficient lifestyle, live more intentionally, all that good stuff. I think, you know, we're entering into an age where, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, People realize a lot of the advertisement that's thrown at you over the years is to convince you that you need this lifestyle, this life, you know, this product. Uh, you got to be making a ton of money, and you know, and all that would give you the happiness and the meaningful life that you you probably crave deep down inside. And, and I think a lot of people have found out that that's, that's not really where it's at, you know, a, a more deliberate lifestyle, living a little bit closer to the earth, um, raising your kids in a, a gentler environment. It's probably a better way to go. I know it has been for me. I mean, I didn't always live this way. I was, uh, I worked for an aircraft company for the first, five years of my professional career and then I went into the military and I stayed there for 20 and neither of those places were kind and gentle uh, environments you know they just weren't I'm gonna turn this light off it's kind of bothering me tight okay so and another thing that people are finding too is their health is directly related to the food that they're eating and the stress level that they're enduring on a daily basis so uh, when you decide that you can do without the six-figure job then it enables you to move away from the, the hustle and bustle um, learn to do with less uh, entertain yourselves with other things other than, you know, the, you know, the nightlife and all that stuff. And, uh, I, I think people are starting to figure that out or maybe people are being drawn to it where before, you know, if you listen to, you know, Budweiser commercials, you would think that in order to be happy, you have to go a different route anyway. So this is worthwhile sharing our experiences with the homestead. It's, it's worthwhile sharing the, the things that we've picked up over the years, figured out. Uh, we didn't start out being experts in homesteading. Uh, it took many years to get to this level, but uh, we think that it is part of our, our mission in life to share this stuff. You know, why shouldn't we share this stuff? It's just, it's just living. It's just how to live, you know, how to grow food, how to prepare food, how to fix things, how to approach problems, how to, just how to live, you know, good old fashioned living. So on this particular show, we would appreciate if you have questions, if you would fire them in, 
in all caps, if you know how to do that. <clears throat> um, I have my lovely wife helping me here. Okay, we just finished up with our, our dinner. She's on the laptop. Uh, I'm just using my phone. Got me an iPhone 11. Oh yeah, we need thumbs ups, thumbs ups, okay? And I'm, I won't take one question until all those thumbs are turned up. No, but it's easy, you just hit the thumbs up. I guess it helps with the whole algorithm thing and all that stuff. <clears throat> there seems to be a lot of censorship on the internet these days. Uh, I keep hearing that and, yeah, I don't know, we talk about things that the tech giants don't really like, like the U.S. Constitution, they really don't like that, so maybe that has something to do with it. Um, yeah, if you could fire in your questions in all caps, then Jill will know, and she can kind of monitor the situation and get them to me. <clears throat> All right, so today, my life went something like this. My uh, third son, third oldest son, called this morning from Japan. He's stationed at Yokota Air Base. He's in the, with the Air Force, as I was. And that was my first duty assignment as well. Um, it was, you know, I, I don't have any pull. Uh, and he, he just got that. They just assigned him there. Um, I guess maybe it's just a coincidence if there are such a thing. So he called and we talked on the phone. And by the time I made it out, it was like quarter of 10. So I was already hampered getting out the door. And then I had a visitor show up. And of course, he brought some of his people with him too. And they stood and we talked for a while. And then I finally got back to it. And then a delivery man showed up with butcher supplies and by the time he left, my oldest son and his wife and two, my two little grandkids were pulling in. So I didn't really get done what I wanted to get done today. Um, but I still had a great day nonetheless because the weather was beautiful out. It was about 60 and a little bit breezy but nice and uh, very bright out, very my kind of weather. I really like it. Right now, it's 50 degrees out, and we're right at 69 degrees in here. So I do not have my wood stove going, but the reason it's probably maintaining temperature in here is because I actually can feel it. It, it has not been on, but all that stone absorbs quite a bit of heat. And it, feels, it, it actually feels like I can, uh, like this heat coming from it. So we're snug in here. I got most of my wood in for the year. Um, I was working on a loader today, and this is a, a piece of apparatus that we use in a field where we're going to farrow our pigs. <clears throat> and there's Debbie Van Fossen. I saw that. Hi, Debbie. And uh, what this is is a small corral within a larger area that... Uh, I can trap the small pigs inside, and that way I can catch them. So if I need to take them out or castrate them or whatever, whatever else is going to have happen to them, I don't have to go chase them around a half an acre pen. All right, so I was working on that. I've had these things for a long time. We had three of them on this farm uh, at one time. None of them were really built to the the original idea of how it was supposed to work. We never did finish any of them, and then we started using them. So two of them we took down. We're no, no longer gonna uh, have pigs in those areas. And I have a whole lot less pigs now than I used to by choice. And uh, the one that I removed and moved here was from another location that we're not gonna use anymore. So this one, I'm, I've got a lot of parts to use to put it together, and uh, it's looking really good so far. I have built some nice doors on it, and uh, I'm going to have a really nice trap door on it. And I, that is going to be my first priority in the morning. <clears throat> and then 
Tomorrow being Thursday, I have to start getting ready for an event that's going to be going on here this Saturday. We're going to have a guest speaker, uh, a constitutional lawyer by the name of Catherine Henry, and she was one of the attorneys that sued the governor of Michigan for, um, you know, the right to open up our businesses and, and so on, and won in the Supreme Court as of last Friday. And now the governor, you know, this week has pulled another rabbit out of her hat. And, uh, you know, she, the governor makes it seem as though she's pulled the magic bullet on us and she's going to keep us closed down forever. Um, it's sort of like payback for whatever. I don't know what we did to her, but she has declared war on us and she wants our businesses closed. She does not want us talking to each other. She doesn't want us going to church. She wants us to put a muzzle on our face. And we've had it, right? So this event started out, we were going to have a little chat with our senator and some of our other LE-type people. Uh, and our senator punked out on us. Uh, but uh, offhand, I just called Catherine. And she, I said, I know it's a long shot, but maybe you could come and talk to a group of patriots here. And she said, sure, I'll come. So she's driving quite a ways to come up and meet with us. But we've got a pretty good group. Uh, I think that if you really look at things as they are, I learned this from an old farmer up in uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. He said, yeah, right. You're going to have a bunch of bureaucrats uh, going up against farmers. And he, 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 he said it like, yeah, right. Like it, it's going to be a bunch of little kids going up against the NFL. And that's really what it is. Because when we draw a crowd of people to this farm, we are drawing every profession there is, I believe. Very few of the people that would be gravitated to us and what we do are are from what I would call the parasite class. Uh, most of our people are craftsmen, engineers, lawyers, doctors, uh, maintenance workers, bakers, cooks, uh, meat cutters, uh, merchants, you know, fishermen, uh, they're all people who produce things, and they have to use their head in order to do that. Farmers, too. Uh, farmers are very versatile people. Uh, there's a lot of extremely intelligent farmers, and uh, they have a handle on their way of life, and they stay in farming for the way of life. And there's a lot of perks to it as well. I think this is the best career field I've ever been in. So when we get a group of people like that together, they're a very capable group of people, you know, welders, pipe fitters, very, very capable people. And you're dealing in state government and county government too. You're dealing with bureaucrats, people who gravitate to those jobs, you know, with the offices and the steady paycheck. And, you know, okay, somebody's got to do those jobs. <clears throat> but over the years, they've gotten to be a little bit, they, they've gotten a little too big for their britches, and they, they've uh, gained a little bit too much authority. So that's the problem, and that's the problem that has to be straightened out, and, and that's kind of where we're going with that whole thing. So um, I believe that this way of life kind of leads to a more, self-sufficient, self-reliant lifestyle where, you know, I, when the COVID happened, uh, a lot of people had became isolated because the, the people that they rely on, they could no longer go to. Where here at Baker's Green Acres, like we're a very diversified, small homestead type farm. Mostly everything that we need, we have, you know. I remember the day that we locked down, we went to the Verizon because my phone quit working. And they had it like you had to wait in the parking lot to get in. 
thought, what's this? And it just so happened that we were like the second car there, and I had called them, and we got in. But after that, they were stacked up outside, and it's been a nightmare ever since, right? And most other things have been like that. But after that little experience, there was nothing that we absolutely needed. Um, even TP, even toilet paper, when the big toilet paper thing happened, it's like, I don't need toilet paper. I hate to tell you this, but I don't need it. I can work around it. I've worked around it for a lot of years if I had to, and I'd do it again. Um, but I called a family member, actually, one of the uh, more highly educated of us in my family, and she was very concerned that they were down to their last two roles. And I said, look, just get paper napkins, right? You know? And she says, no, no, you can't. It'll clog the pipes. She had been told that. It was on the news. Don't use anything but toilet paper. All right, so. This lifestyle leads to being able to think for yourself and operate, you know, in an environment that's changing all the time. And it looks like there's going to be a lot more changes. But it's sort of an environment that we thrive in, really. You know, I, I've enjoyed it and then people will come and they'll have ideas how to work around stuff. And it's, it's kind of a good environment for the homesteader. It really is. Uh, uh, there's a level of preparedness that comes from being in this lifestyle. Um, winter's coming, so you have to prepare for that. And, you know, your source of dollars could get cut off, so you have to prepare for that. You, you have to do a lot of thinking. And so we do that. So I am here to answer questions and I don't mind answering questions about preparing or prepping as it's known. Prepping is uh, preparing for, you know, some sort of thing that's going to come that's going to really put a crimp in your lifestyle. It could be a zombie apocalypse. It could be a tornado. It could be, you name it, it could be a breakdown in the toilet paper factory, right? It could be uh, a supply chain disruption. It could be uh, the electrical grid malfunctioning and going down for an extended period of time. It could be a lot of different things. It could be a failure of the money system. It could be um, hordes of crazed uh, Antifa taken to the streets. Those guys kill me. I mean, they're like 17 year old boys wearing their sister's jeans and we're supposed to really be petrified of them. They get the spray can and I'm going to break windows. I think they'd make short work of them in the neck of the woods that I live in. Anyway, I am ready to take questions. And uh, if there aren't fatherless kids, what was that about? When you were just talking about Crazy kids. Oh. No. Oh. Well, I don't mention it very often, but I have eight children. So Jill and I have been fertile. <laughs> That's what I always say about farming. It's it's all about fertility, right? So, you know, I figure you gotta practice what you preach. But it's really nice having a lot of kids because uh, we can always use extra hands to do things, and the kids learn so much on on the farm. And uh, there was an interesting thing that happened today. My son Jim, I would like to get in him into stonework because he's a he's got a an eye for things, and I had him do some stonework in laying some stones into the ground. So you you cut the ground out, you cut the sod out, just in the right shape. And then you fit a stone in there to make a walkway. And he did that. And one of my dogs uh, did a little digging right in that area. So he got to learn the hard way, you know, how the dogs can be and having your, your work disrupted like that. So that was what he did this morning. He had to get that straightened out. Had a good day, and I am ready for some questions. I got a cup of coffee here. I can't wait. To hit the ground running tomorrow morning. I'm ready, mother. She got nothing. 
Everybody knows everything. Our internet's working good tonight, too. We haven't had uh, a problem yet. The last couple of nights, it's been a little aggravating that we were buffering very, very badly. Um, I thought this morning there was going to be some extremely interesting news coming our way because, as you may or may not know, the president ordered a declassification of all documents uh, pertaining to the email scandal and the Obamagate scandal. So, supposedly, uh, there's some, some hellacious uh, information in there. And then the Department of Justice said, well, we got to have a press conference. So it sounded like there was going to be charges leveled against some of those folks, and uh, they were getting ready to, for mayhem to ensue. Um, so long as there's no questions, I will reiterate again that there is questions. Well, I've got one here. Tips and tricks on watering your stack through the winter. Because it's getting cold. Yeah, it is getting cold. And that is one of the things that really turns people off about farming in the wintertime. But... Um, you have to look at it a different way. You have to look at it a different way. So our chickens are probably a hundred yards from the house. And so I don't take care of the chickens anymore. That's, you know, I've passed that off and it's either the youngest kid or the second youngest kid has that job. And right now it's the second youngest kid. So in the winter time, he's got to make sure that they have feed and water. Right. In the summertime, we have a hose that goes to their pen, and then there's a, a waterer in there that has a float in it, and the water stays full all the time. Um, you can drive by, walk by, whatever, and you can see that they have water. If they don't have water, they're going to be kind of upset. And uh, it, the drinking cups that we used use uh have been really good they're uh big john no little giant watering cups and i have one in the other room if it's if you guys want to see what that looks like but anyway in the winter time those don't work i mean right now i'm watching the uh the weather and we we're gonna have weather in the 40s at night for about the next 10 days and then it's going to start um lone star just asked a question i didn't quite yeah. okay and then we're going to uh we're going to start pulling in all the waterers uh we're knocking off the last of our broiler chickens this friday so we won't need to be watering them anymore um the turkeys uh, we're watering them kind of manually. Um, there's about 60 turkeys out there, 50, 60 turkeys. And so that's about five gallons per day. Um, other than that, uh, I have cows and I have pigs. So with the cows, we have big watering troughs and their watering troughs won't start to ice up until much later in the year, like, like December. And when they start to ice up kind of bad, uh, I will be moving that trough inside, which helps me a little bit. And it's a 275 gallon trough. But then I put a, it's called a bird bath heater. And it's just a little donut about this big. And when the when the trough is inside and you have that down in it, it puts enough heat into the water to keep it open. Now, when it gets really cold, which we'll usually have two, three, four weeks of really cold, like usually 20 below here is, is about it, wouldn't you say? And not even like 15 below, 12 below. Is, is a pretty constant thing. We seem to see that quite a bit. And we'll just have it 
you know, for two, three weeks. And during those times, I mean, you're extra, extra cautious uh, because, you know, things go wrong when it gets that cold. I mean, when you live in an in a environment where it's like that, I used to live in northern Maine, and it would be like that, like most of the winter. And stuff breaks when it gets cold like that. Batteries go down. Um, you know, thermostats fail in vehicles. Uh, you get moisture in the air valve on, on tires, and all of a sudden you go out, it's freezing cold, and you got a flat. <laughs> you know, I mean, things go, things go wrong, so you're just really careful. When it's cold, cold, cold like that, if I don't have to start a vehicle, I don't. So I may just do without my tractor during those times, or I plug the tractor in. Um, so I'm taking precautions when it's cold. But as far as the water goes, um, I may have to break a little ice for the cows. That's about it. Uh, if for some reason we don't have water coming from our pump, from our well, then I would be cutting holes in the ice on the pond for the cows. That would be my backup for them. Uh, the backup to that, in reality, the cows do go out and lick snow. They really do. Uh, you wouldn't want to have a dairy cow, a cow that you're milking, have to rely on that. You want her to have all the luxuries that you can give her if you want to continue to get, you know, the, the milk that, that she's capable of. All right, uh, as far as our chickens go, um, one of the kids will have to fill up a bucket every morning, and we have a building in between here and there. It's a butcher shop. I have a water heater going down there all the time, and so the kids are, you know, it's one of, one of them's job to fill up a, a bucket, take it out. The bucket that, or the, uh, the pan that the chickens drink out of, and there's probably between 50 and 75 of them down there, so it's not like you can turn your back on them. Uh, their pan is one of those flexible black rubber, I think they make them out of old tires, and they're indestructible. All you have to do is turn that over, and it's only about this deep, and step on it, and the ice comes out in a chunk. So towards the end of winter, there's chunks of ice out there all over the place um, and then the new bucket goes in there now I suppose we could run an extension cord out there into that and put a bird bath heater in that we could we just don't and part of my mission here is training my kids so like I say a lot of times yeah you can do that by having them clean their rooms and make their beds and stuff and if that's all there is to do around the house, then that's the best you got. But this is, they have to feed and water animals, and it's imperative that they do it. And when they don't do it, uh, either I'm jumping them or somebody's jumping them, and they start to learn what it would be like. Hey, what, 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 how would you feel if mom didn't uh, give you breakfast this morning? She just didn't do it. And you were sitting at the table, and you're still sitting there at lunch. Nope, nothing today for you, and nothing to drink either. So they learn. So if you're going to do this, uh, is carrying a bucket of water out in the morning too much to, to ask? I don't think it is. As a matter of fact, most of us could, would benefit from, you know, the, the physical exertion and the walk and the, the cool air in the morning would, would be good for you. So I would say do that. Don't, don't say, oh, I don't want to water them in the wintertime. I'm not going to raise pigs because you've got to water them in the wintertime. <sighs> do you like to eat pork chops? I mean, there's a sacrifice that you have to make to do it. So I would say just grin and bear it, and uh, it's not so bad. I mean, there's worse things. I mean, a lot of you are going to go in and sit in a cubicle and look at a screen all day long. I would go bonkers if I had to do that. Um, now with pigs, I'm going to say this and it's controversial and I've taken a lot of beatings over it. And I think everybody that was going to beat me has probably already done it. So I'm just going to say it anyway.
But we, through a process, we figured out that pigs eat snow. At least mangalitsa pigs eat snow. So we would put water out for them and they would just throw it around, play in it, get wet. But they wouldn't drink it. They would prefer to eat snow. So we have a lot of snow here. And so for my pigs, I don't provide them with water in the wintertime. So long as there's snow. If there's no snow, then I have a tank that I fill at a frost-free. I have a frost-free hydrant that I can fill really quickly. And I will take it out there and I'll... Picture and sound just became very good. So all this time it hasn't been good? It's been fine Okay. Here. Sorry about that. I'm really sorry for the internet connection. It just, it's beyond our control, I think. You know, we tried some apparatus, but it seemed like it worked worse, you know, with the booster and all that stuff. So I don't, I don't really know what the answer is. I'm hoping that uh, things just get better when the weather dries out and things like that. Um, so with my pigs, that's how I get moisture to them. I just let them eat snow. And if you came here and saw my pigs in the wintertime, you'd say, well, they're not hurting for anything. Um, a lot of what you read about, like in university books, really pertains more to um, agribusiness or industrial agriculture. So if your pigs are in a, in a hog house scenario, and you don't provide them with water, yeah, it's going to hurt them because they're on a really dry feed. And it's really all they have. You're providing them feed, water, and, and the, the warmth of the hog house. And if you take one of those products away, you know, water, um, then they're going to have a tough time. With the pigs, uh, our pigs out on pasture, um, like right now, today, the last few days, we've been feeding them acorns, all right? So we went out acorning on Sunday. And we've got places we go where we, and it's classified, I can't tell anybody, I'm sworn to secrecy. But the acorns, I brought one in because I want to show you guys this acorn. But I handed it to my grandson, and I don't see it around. But this acorn literally was that big. I mean, they probably weigh about an ounce. And the meats inside of them is just beautiful. And uh, we picked up uh, a, a water trough full. I mean, we kind of, we kind of just went last minute and we just went just to kind of recon. We weren't really serious about picking up, but we filled uh, a water trough. Off. Normally we take a 275 gallon uh, tote and we fill that baby up when we're serious about it and that's a lot of feed right there. Um, you can look into acorns, feeding acorns to pigs and it's fascinating the stuff that you'll learn. One of the things that I've learned is that acorns have four times the caloric value as the best feed corn known. Four times per weight. That's pretty good. A lot of uh, very complex fats in acorns where corn is pretty simple fats uh, and the mineral content in corn is almost non-existent. I mean, there's some, but it's just very common, and this piece is going to have the same as this piece. But with acorns, uh, we we collect from trees all over the place. All right, so there's this one tree. I can't tell you where it is, but it's right in the middle of it, – it's in a triangle. There's a road that goes this way, a road goes this way. So it's sitting – on a triangle of grass and it's by the lake and this tree is massive and it drops the nicest acorns that you've ever seen if you like acorns I guess um, but that tree or, or the 
caloric value and the mineral content of those acorns is going to be way different than another tree over by Lake Mitchell in Cadillac that we kind of like too um, because of the geographical difference in location and the different soils, the different environment and so on, you know. Uh, a little story about acorns. My wife's grandfather, uh, in his later years, him and grandma sold the farm and moved to a house on the lake, on Lake Musaki. Real nice place. <coughs> and he took really good care of his lawn. He had a pump that pumped water out of the lake. And he would fertilize the grass out in front of his house. He would fertilize everything, the shrubs, everything. The place was really, really nice. But the trees, the oak trees, started dropping massive acorns, right? Breaking windshield now, but making dents in the car, dropping on the roof, filling the gutters. Uh, he would be out there brooming off the driveway. Ten minutes later, there'd be acorns all, all over the driveway. Somebody would pull in and crush them, and he would, he hated acorns. He called them acorns. He hated them. And him and I were having a, uh, a conversation one time. He's passed now. He's been gone quite a while. We were having a conversation one time and I said, I wonder if there's anything you can do with those things. And he said, I don't know. I don't think you can even feed them to pigs because it would probably make the meat bitter. And he said this. He was a lifelong farmer. Not really a pig guy, but I know they did raise some pigs, but they were mostly cattle. And so I just, I just heard that, and okay. I, I mean, I never thought that you could feed acorns to pigs. But then when I got into Mangalitsa and the whole charcuterie thing and the whole re, uh, the reason that you want your pigs to have a, a high uh, night Uh, what is it that's in acorns? Uh, tannic acid. Tannic acid. You want a high tannic acid uh, diet is because the tannic acid gets into their fat and it resists rancidity, right? And rancidity, all that is, is the animal going from walking around on the earth to being part of the earth. You know, when an animal rots, it goes back to the earth. Same as a uh, human being, same as an oak tree when it falls over, it winds up going back to the earth. Um, but when they have a high tannic acid diet, the tannic acid gets in the fat and it resists rancidity and that is what gives us the ability to kill a hog in the fall that's been acorn fed, take that rear shank or the rear ham put a little salt on the bone and hang that baby up and it'll keep, it'll stabilize. And you'll, you know, you can hang a ham when your daughter is born and you can serve it at her wedding, right? So, I mean, that story is one in one of my books. I mean, not that I've actually done that, but I mean, you can, we have hams around here that are, going on three years old now that we just haven't gotten into. Um, so that's why we do the, the acorn thing, plus the, uh, plus the money savings. I mean, I've been feeding these, this group of pigs, there's 27 little ones, three sows and a boar in there, and I have fed them nothing but acorns since Sunday night. And here it is, what, Wednesday, and... I've probably only gone down about this far in the in the trough, and I probably have this much far farther to go. A lot of acorns, a lot of weight, all free, and they just seem to they love them. You know, usually if I'm working out there, I have to feed them because they'll stand at the at the fence, and there's one or two of them that just have this whine. And they'll just keep it up until I give them something. And if I'm trying to work out there, uh, you know, I can't listen to the whining. So, but all this week, there's still acorns on the ground that they haven't gotten into. That's the nice thing about them too. 
you throw the whole acorns in, the, they eat what they can. At first they're ravenous, right? But then when they're full, they slow down and they start eating the acorns sort of like, uh, like a toucan would eat a, uh, a Brazil nut. You know, they crack it and then they sort of swoop that the meat out of there and then the, the shells go on the ground when they're competing and they're all hungry and they think they want to eat more than the next guy. They're very piggish, you know, they're very hoggish. <clears throat> they'll just chow down the whole nut, top and all. They'll just chow it down. So acorning is a good thing. It's a, a great pastime around here. And we actually stopped at a pizza place on the way home and able, were able to go into the pizza place. This was Sunday. The, the governor's order was struck down by the Supreme Court on Friday. Of course, the restaurants are still scared, you know, most of them. But we went in and just act like we owned the place, and we just sat in there and ate our pizza. It was great. We had like the second time we've been out since the China virus hit. Okay, I'm ready for questions. Yep, I got some for you now. Okay, all right. I just wanted to know how your root cellar's working. It's good. Next. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I got some bugs to work out because I was showing it to my daughter-in-law today. And I noticed some of the squash that had been scuffed were starting to mold right there. So that tells me that I'm way too moist down there. So that means I have to vent the root cellar out. And there's a process to do that. You want to bring a tube in from outside. You want to bring it right to the floor, a couple inches off the floor and then bring another tube in and have it come in at the top of the root cellar. So the moist, warm air will be coming off the ground, right? Because the ground's going to be 45 and outside it could be zero. And so it will create a draft. And when you create that draft in there, you create a vacuum in there. And then the other tube that is up high will pull dry cold air in which is fine even if it's zero degrees but what you want to do is you want to start looking at the humidity and if it drops below 50 i'm not sure bryce i'm not sure whether it's 50 or 60 for hanging meat it's 60 but for vegetables i'm not sure but is it 50 it's cooler for vegetables that was why we so be a challenge. Okay. No, I'm talking humidity. Oh. Percent. I'm not sure what the percentage of humidity is. Um, but you want to watch that. And if your humidity, if it gets too dry, that's not good either. And then you would slow down the draft. So on the bottom, you would have a valve that you could valve it out. So there's less exchange of air from the outside coming in to the inside. So I got a little bit of a mold problem and I noticed there was a board down there that had some mold on it. It was white mold, so I'm okay with that, but I'm still gonna go down there with some apple cider vinegar. And, uh, you know, we, white mold's okay. White mold is okay. When we start seeing the greens and the blacks, then it's not good. So I'm gonna keep a spray bottle down there of uh, vinegar and just start checking it a little bit more. Um, there was a pumpkin, too, that had gotten scuffed bad that had a little mold on it. So that pumpkin's going to just come out, and we'll use that first. But I looked through everything else that was down there, <clears throat> and I didn't see any problems. Um, so what did that say? The temperature, the temperature in the meeting? The humidity needs to equal 100. Oh, wow, that's, that's an interesting concept. Temperature and humidity. Hmm, that's an interesting concept. So if we're 60 degrees down there, then our 40% humidity. humidity. Okay, I'd like to know where that came from, but I, I'm, sh I'm sure I can find it. 
Seems okay. Like, oh, Finn says he's heard the same thing. Okay. And that's what they do. Well, the structure is built. Uh, I have the door on the top. The, the stairway down is insulated. I don't have the door uh, at the bottom of the stairs yet. And the reason I don't is just it's a priority thing. Uh, 50 degrees and 50% from Kaleidoscope. Kaleidoscope's had some good info over the years. Okay. 60, 40. Well, right, so just long said equals 100. Okay. What about, what about 90 10 <laughs> or 10 90? I mean, it's got to be, you know. All right. Well, that's good info. Um, and, and I know I have a problem there now, but I know the fix is available. Quick story uh, we had a hanging room. The, the house that is next door to us used to belong to us. And I built a hanging room over there. And we used to do our classes there. People, we'd have people stay there. Um, we decided against that. And so we sold that house. So we no longer have that hanging room. But that hanging room, uh, I built it to what I thought would be a good spec. Uh, I put it on the north wall. So the north wall was cool in the summertime. And we started having some problems in the fall with mold on the meat so the meat was not uh it, it was not dry enough it was too moist in there and then i had a guy that came to take our class and i, I this guy was great i mean i've had a lot of really cool people come and take classes but this guy was unique in that uh there was just things about him that were very very different uh he was probably about a 25 year old guy that was coming from Chicago up here to take a class on butchering pigs. And, you know, he, he rolled his own and he smoked a corn cob pipe and he was just very different being from Chicago and him. And he also made his own beer and he brought a bunch with him and me and him sat down after I think the second day of the class and we were at the house just, yucking it up. And I said, so what makes a guy like you want to take a class like this? And he says, oh, you know, I, I'm kind of basically retired. So I, I just want to collect some skills. And I said, you're retired. How's a 25 year old guy get retired? And he says, well, he says, uh, I was kind of a computer nerd when I was a kid. And, uh, when I was 16, I actually hacked into the air force's computer system. And I was fooling around in there for about a month before they found out who it was. And uh, I was arrested. My parents were arrested. And da 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 It took several months before they returned to their home. But uh, um, when he was 18, the Air Force hired him. And he worked for them for a short period of time. Then he started his own company. And as soon as that company was publicly traded, he sold it. So that's why he was independently wealthy at 25 or 23, whatever it was, but very inter interesting guy. But I told him, Hey, I'm having a problem with this, with mold in here. And he's in there looking at it a little bit. And he says, Oh, I see the problem. I said, you do. And he says, yeah, lower this window down like four inches. Okay. I did. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> it worked. So I had, a window on the front of the of the door and it was a double hung window so you could you could pull it down and you could also pick it up <clears throat> and when I built it I figured that we'd have an exchange of air because one was higher and I don't know if you know this but heat rises <clears throat> and so uh, if I lowered this one down I had a better exchange and therefore we had less moisture in the room brought the humidity down and voila no more mold so the fix is there and the reason i'm kidding about heat rises when i got out of the air force i moved here and in the course of about a month i had two people say to me in in total earnestness but well, heat rises you know okay thanks Glad you told me because I, 
I wouldn't have known that. But we joked around about it for years. But in reality, heat does not rise. You can't say that. That that is not true. Hot air rises, right? But a hot ball bearing doesn't rise. Heat radiates. Okay. I'll go to the next question. <laughs> uh, Kaleidoscope did wonder if you had put in a sump. She had to do that as well. I didn't have to. Where we dug this, it, it's like sand. And I don't have any flooding problems. This is our property on the, on the front part of our property where we live. It's very dry, sandy. Um, and on the back, the back 40, they would call it, um, it's very low. And, you know, you put in a post hole down there and you hit water. So, no, I didn't have to put in a sump pump, and I'm really glad that I didn't. That would be like a, a level of complexity that oh, if the pump fails, you know, all my pumpkins are going to get flooded. I probably would have stayed away from that. Um, Same thing with a basement that you have to run a pump to drain. Uh, that just doesn't sound like fun to me. Uh, Lone Star wanted to know, do you have to drain the pool for winter, and do you ever see bears? Um, the, the directions on the pool said you should drain it, fold up the liner, and, you know, reassemble it in the spring. From, from my uh, experience, something like a pool liner, if it was folded up, and you didn't put it in a hermetically sealed steel container that's welded shut, mice would get in it and they would gnaw holes through it. That's just mice. Um, and so I decided, I made the decision, I did some research and I made the decision to not do that. Um, that liner, if I get six years out of it, I'm good. You know, I'm fine with that. You know, if you amortize that out over, say, you know, the pool was $1,500. So if you amortize that out over 10 years, 150 bucks a year, no problem. At the end of 10 years, I'll do one of those things where I slit it and let all the water go. But, um, no, I decided to keep the water in it. And then the water last year became almost... Uh, a solid chunk, you know, probably froze in a foot or so all the way around. And it was just stable, you know, it wasn't going to go anywhere. So this year we covered it. Last year we didn't because I was going to drain it. And it was just at the last minute when I'm standing there looking at it, thinking about pulling the plug where I said, I don't think this is a good idea. And then uh, to set it back up and get it in the right spot, as far as the, um, the deck goes, I thought would be tricky and you wouldn't know until you got it full. So we didn't. Yeah, right. Put in a heater and call it a hot tub. I, <laughs> that's on my list, right? I think hot tubs are really cool. The problem is if you buy one, then you're going to feel obligated to use it. I want to build one that I can fire up five times in a, a winter and it, it can turn to solid and then I want it so that it's got a firebox on the side of it so I can chuck that full of, of firewood, touch it off and then, hey, the hot tub's going, you know, let's use it. And then when we're done with it, you're probably not going to want to do it two nights in a row. But would you want to keep that thing going all winter long and put out that kind of energy, you know, to have a hot tub going? Did somebody say something? Kaleidoscope, ha ha ha, hot tubs are funny. Hot tubs are cool. Yeah. Well, me and Jill, before uh, we had a lot of kids, 
we stayed at a place that had a hot tub and it was outside and we had gone skiing and it was so cold that we wound up coming back to the, the we were getting, we had a hotel room. And uh, so we went and got in the hot tub and it was outside and Jill's hair, we put it kind of up on her head and let it freeze. And it was pretty neat. I like hot tubs. It'd be really nice here because we have the outside, uh, you know, we have really nice stars. And the nights here are beautiful and totally quiet. As far as bears, I meant to talk to the bee guy the other day because it looked like something got into one of his, his hives from far, as far, as close as I could get to it without getting stung. And then they were down there doing something. I saw the smoke going and uh, they had their bee suits on, but I didn't get a chance to talk to them. So I don't know if it was a bear that got into it or not. Could have been just a, like a raccoon. Or maybe they set it up in such a way that it appeared as though something had gotten into it. We, we got them around here. Uh, we've never seen one. Jill and I haven't, not around here. Uh, but I think our dogs have a lot to do with that. Bears uh, move away from the dogs. But with as, as much cornfield as we have around here, the bears, you know, they that's their main source of food in the summertime. They really gorge themselves. <coughs> but they're not a problem. Not, dogs. Yeah, not in Michigan, they're not a problem. Um, Bryce wanted to know, how late in the year have you planted rye? And someone else asked yeah. a question about the rye, too. It wasn't in caps, so it's going to take me a sec. But they asked what kind of rye. Is it the grass type or grain type? Oh, it's the grain type. And... Uh, one year, see, I don't have the date, Bryce, but if I had a field that was open now and I had some rye and I needed something to do, I would do it now, and it's October. What your goal is is to get it to germinate. And, you know, like on a day like today, the soil was nice and warm, so we, you could have gotten germination today. And once it germinates, I mean, it's really cold, hardy stuff. So, um, like I say a lot of times, I think, I mean, I, I haven't seen anybody else agree with me. <laughs> and I don't know if it's on Wikipedia, but I think it grows under the snow. Um, I haven't exactly tested it, like, tested the length of it and then the next spring but it usually the snow recedes slowly but it seems like as soon as it's gone wow look at that rye that really so I believe it does grow under the snow so you'll, you'll rye will be bright green by the time snow comes and um, it will not bolt in the fall, it's it knows enough to wait until spring, um, and I think you would probably know more about that why that happens. I'm, I'm not really sure, but um, for instance, last year, September, late in September, I planted a uh, hundred by a hundred patch in my grow area, and it got up to five inches maybe or less. I mean, it was covered and it wasn't really covered that good. I was not real happy with it, but I had made a video back then. So it's someplace in the archives. And then this spring, when the snow went, um, it took off. I mean, took off. And I was so impressed with the growth and all the, the thick foliage that was out there. We actually put chicken tractors on it because it started growing long before the grass started growing. And it was putting out a lot of green. 
and the chickens do well on that. It keeps them healthy. So um, I did make a video then, and that rye was up over my head. And then I put pigs in on it, and they just made, you know, it, it looked like a straw field after that. Like there was just straw out there. Everything was uh, brown. Then they had taken all the leaf off. They'd eaten a lot of the tops. You know, it bolts, and then it has a head on top of it. And it was time for them to come off because I had another field that was ready for them to go on. So I moved them off, and then there's all this material out there. All this, it looked like you busted open, you know, five round bales out there of straw. And I thought, wow, that's going to be, you know, it'll take a while for that to decompose. Um, I could touch it off. I could just burn it. And that would put some nice things into the soil. But I decided I'm just going to try and hit it with a rototiller and see what happens. Well, I did. No, actually, I didn't. I started to do it. And then something, somebody came in and interrupted me. And my son Keith jumped on the tiller because he was wanting to put his time in that day, you know. And that's good easy duty. And he tilled it all down. And when I went out there and I looked, it kind of reminded me of... This is going to sound really gross. You know, ever see a guy with a real hairy back and his t-shirt is just being held up by the hair? It kind of reminded me of that. So all that, that straw had been put down and it was holding the soil up. So it was creating airways, air passages, and it just looked like a really good situation. We got a little bit of rain, like a half inch of rain. And then that field, boom, took off just in the kernels that had, you know, fallen. And it got up to about like this. And uh, I put calves in on it because it was just so much beautiful green out there. And at first they didn't really like it, but then they, they took to it and they ate quite a bit of it. So it's still there. And I think that next spring it's going to just explode again. And we'll kind of have a thing going uh, where we never quite clear it off. And it, it will adapt to the soil that's here. And, and I believe that as it's adapting to the soil, it's transmitting to the soil, hey, we need this. And then the soil is... I believe the mycelium goes and looks for the nutrient that it needs, I think. Next. How, uh, so how many pigs do you have? And then there's a follow-up, kind of. Um, that was Kirk's question. Kaleidoscope wanted to know how far are you pigs from the house? Do you put up bat houses for insect control? All right, how many pigs do I have? Let's see, 27, 31, 32, 33, plus 10, 43, 50. I got 50 of them now. And it's across the board. You know, I've got three big sows that we're going to use for our classes this fall. So they're going to be not here long. I've got uh, 27 newborns that are about four weeks old. I'm just getting ready to castrate. I have three sows that they came from and then two other sows that are up and coming. So my, my plan for the foreseeable future is to keep one boar and five sows. And that gives me way more than I need for our homestead but it gives me a little bit extra, well, quite a bit extra for, you know, swapping with my friends and selling a little bit here and there um, and feeding out as many as I think that I want to. If I have a big influx of food for them, then I would feed out more of them. Uh, less food, I would sell more of them as young, young ones. And... That's a lot of pigs, but we have a butcher shop, so when we ever have 
more pigs than we need, then we can just make them shelf stable, put them on the shelf and then use, use them when we need them. I'm, I'm redoing my farrowing area. My farrowing area is a square half acre and it's a field that is, and this is, goes to Kaleidoscope's question. I made a video, uh, I think yesterday, on this structure that I'm building. We call them loaders. And it's, I'm having deja vu. Did I already explain this today? Yeah, it's a small corral, 12 by 12, and it's got a swing gate on the front of it. And it's inside the pen. <clears throat> Oh, the debate, is that going on? It's 908 right now. Oh, that would be a good one to watch. Um, but it's got a swing gate on the front of it. I really need the, um, the uh, whiteboard. But the idea is that if I feed inside of it and the pigs get used to going in, then I can shut the gate and I have them in a smaller area and I'm able to, you know, do what I need. I can catch who I want to catch. And then if I want to load out a big pig from there, you know, a 500 pounder, let's say, they don't exactly jump in the trailer when you ask them to. And if you don't have a way to force them, um, you sometimes you can't load them. Uh, so this is a way that... I can force them into a trailer if I want them to get into a trailer. And I've learned over the years of just little tricks here and there to uh, make them want to get into something else. You know, the, who's that gal? Uh, Grandin? Sybil Grandin? Oh, yeah, yeah. Temple. Temple, Temple Grandin. She was, uh, ah, she, she got down low, low to the ground and looked at what the animals see and she designed animal handling systems. Uh, she was definitely like a special needs type person, but she was able to look at it from their point of view. And so I've tried to do that too. I've looked at it so that when you are handling them, you're presenting them with options. Like I can stay here and I can have this person yelling at me or I can just move forward and get away from him. And you kind of want that. And then if they're not sensitive to getting yelled at, then you can kind of slap them on the, on the ham or poke them with something, you know, or, you know, swat them with something. Uh, they have paddles that are about this big that have a rattle inside of them and pigs really don't like those. So you hit them with that and they want to move away from it. So I'm building one of those inside this farrowing area and I'm really doing all the things in this small farrowing area that I've wanted to do for years to make this system. And it is a system. You've got a boar, you've got a couple of sows, you've got a fenced in area, you have an electric fencer, you have a loader, you have a place for them to sleep, uh, you have a water system in there. So it, the whole thing is a system. And if it's working efficiently, uh, you pigs are always gonna have water. Uh, they're not going to get out and get into your garden. Uh, when you need to handle them, you can do it and it's less stressful, right? Handling big pigs is always stressful, but it will be less stressful. Uh, if you need to castrate little ones, it'll be less stressful because you don't have to chase them. And so you're all out of breath and trying to cut. Um, it's pleasant to be out there when people come and they want to look at pigs, you know, if they're going to pick them out. It's a pleasant area, you know, that's easy to catch them. Uh, I mean, I got some other things that I want to do, but, uh, I'm, I'm really getting to the place where this is going to be the way I want it. And I've wanted it for years. 
So it's it's more of my when I got when I say you know if you're if you're standing around you could be fortifying your position you could be filling in one more sandbag you know to put up on the around your your position just that one more sandbag that could catch one bullet that would otherwise hit you in the throat but no you had to stand around with your hands in your pockets no don't do that always fortify your position so it's like that in firemen too you can always do things to make it better and as i'm doing this all of a sudden I said, wow, you know what? I should put that fencer over here. Then it can't get hit. Nobody can get to it. The animals can't get to it. And it's up a little higher. Because where I have it now, it's down kind of low. And when I want to shut it off, I got to get way down here to look at it. Um, but I'm going to put it up higher. And then all I have to do is flick it off when I want to flick it off. So there's always things you can do. I want to have a better watering system in there as well. Uh, I think I waste a little bit too much water. I want to have a trough in there that I'm going to build out of a tractor tire, I'm thinking. I'll cut it in such a way and then seal it up and then have it be tough enough that if they want to get in there, fine, go ahead, get in there. But when I fill it, it'll be, it'll be, you know, it'll hold water for a little bit longer. Did I get all those questions? Um, I got one more for you. Shoot. How are horse chestnuts for pig feed? Heard they're not really good for anything. But there's tons of them. This is actually Laura's question. Oh, yeah. And she didn't know if the deer are eating them or not because the trees that she has available to her are in town. So. Horse chestnuts which are different than the chestnuts. All right. Well, when I was a kid, we had horse chestnut trees and they told us that we couldn't eat those. And I don't think I ever did because I wasn't an, an adventurous youth like I am now. You know, if I was told you shouldn't eat something, it would be like, okay, I'm not gonna eat it. Where now I'd be like, well, I'll try a little. Um, Years back, a guy brought a whole bunch of chestnuts here. You remember that? And he was supposed to be here on a certain day, and he called and he said, my truck broke down. And he was bringing them, and he thought that if the pigs would eat them, because he had a lot of them that he couldn't sell because they were seconds that maybe we could do some wheeling and dealing it and I could use them. And so he could sell them to me. So that was his thought. He says, I'll just bring you a bunch and see how the pigs do on them. His truck broke down. I wasn't home when he finally did show up and he left them. I fed them. No problems. The pigs loved them, but these were not horse chestnuts. Horse chestnuts, I don't think they're any different. Uh, she says they are different. So. Ah, okay. But well, here's the deal the with... To try is here's the deal. Offer, them to offer a few of them to the pigs along with their other food. See how it goes. Uh, maybe even the goats too. Given choices, they won't eat toxic things. Concur. So just give it to them, and if they eat it, then it's okay. But if you want to play it safe, only give them a few. And, you know, I've never heard of a pig eating something that killed it. Have you? Mm. I suppose it's possible, but... Yeah. Uh, they're made to eat a lot of junk. They're cleaners. They're made to eat nasty, yucky stuff. But it I would make even a goat sick. But so. we, we had a goat die from eating something that he shouldn't have. And it was pig feed. Oh. And he ate a lot of it until he finally he died. His belly up. Yeah. yeah. But I that could be a really nice source of of uh, of calories right there. I would def, if it was me, I'd just throw them to him and see what happens. 
Um, what were those nuts that your dad brought here? Black walnuts? Black walnuts. That could be. Yeah. They're kind of a nasty thing about this big, and I think that they're tough to get into. And he brought a whole bunch of them. And I would trip over them in the garage like, what are these doing here? Why are these here? Who brought these here? And dropped them in my garage. And somebody told me, and I said, okay, well, then they're for the pigs, so I'm going to give them to the pigs. I gave them to them, and they disappeared. Husks and all. Everything was gone. Um, I would get a little, I would be pretty adventurous when it comes to stuff like that that you can scrounge for your pigs. And I wouldn't be too concerned that you're going to um, poison them. Like Jill said, they're not going to eat anything that's bad for them, that's detrimental to them. Now, I think if you took like rat poison and, and put it in a piece of cheese or something, I think you'd fool them into killing themselves, but... Our pigs eat coffee grounds, they eat chicken bones. I really, they eat everything, just everything. How are we doing? That's it. Are we and out of? <laughs> they're just laying around everywhere on the side of the road, so wow. we go. Yeah, and maybe the town will pay you to pick them up. <laughs> Yard cleanup in town. Yeah. Yep. You know, that's something to consider when you have pigs. Uh, when you have, oh, well, the pine boughs things, you know, that was an adverse uh, situation. All right. That was during the whole pig siege here. I couldn't, we were not selling pigs. Uh, the state was, you know, sort of like the, the governor is doing right now. She threatened people. Uh, well, it wasn't her at the time, but they, they threatened people. And people kind of, they project threats on themselves. Like, I don't want to get in trouble from the state, you know, and they're so afraid. And so we weren't selling any pigs. We had a lot of pigs, and we didn't have the money coming in, so we couldn't really afford, afford to feed them. And I was just giving them anything I could find. I was giving them straw, hay, anything. And we found a bunch of pine boughs. Uh, some guy had cut down some trees on the state land and just left the boughs there. And so we put a rope around a bunch of them and dragged them home. And I dragged them in with the pigs and they ate them. So, I mean, they didn't chow down on them like, oh, pound buys pine boughs but after a while you know there wasn't a lot else to eat and they just they did eat them uh i can tell you this though in the winter time if you cut down a maple tree they love maple bark they will they will strip the bark off of maple boughs like perfectly and then you just have the nice, like, naked skeleton. They do a real good job on that. It's fun to do just, just to see how well they do it. And I, and I think that they get quite a bit of nutrient out of that. That's the whole thing about the, the mangalitsa is they can turn things into high-quality, uh, lean and, and fat that you can't eat. That's what makes them one of the best homestead uh, species of animals or prepper, prep stead or anything like that. Because, you know, there's always stuff around that you can find. Like if you, if you mow your lawn and you have a bagger, you just collected a lot of caloric value. You just, that's what you just did. And you can feed that to your pigs, chickens too. Um, and in doing so, you cut, you're feeding the ground that they're on, too. So if you, this is cool, you drive around these days, and people are going to the store, and they're buying bags, and they're raking their yards and putting the leaves in these bags, and then they stack these bags out in front of their house, all really nice and neat and everything. And then the trash guy is coming picking them up. Or somebody is. 
You know, you see it in town. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with these people, you know? But if they've done all that work, they don't care who picks it up as long as it's gone. And so, let's say that you have nominal ground that your, your pigs are on. Pick that stuff up. Bring it home. Dump it in your pig pastures. They'll go through it, eat what they can, but the rest of it becomes nutrient for your ground. And so when your pigs go out there and they manure and they're putting down a high bacterial, you know, turd and there's other things around that, that the, the bacteria can eat, that will build soil, you know, and you just keep doing that. And I don't know, it's an easy way to bring in a lot of carbon to your soil. Or if you have somebody in your family that is a a lawn and garden maintenance engineer and they they do lawn care you know that's pretty profitable in some necks of the woods yeah bring that stuff home want to make a little extra money raking leaves uh we offer a discount for people with oak leaves because you know you're going to find you know acorns and acorns are a tremendous source of food for your pigs so it's, that's a way that if you had to do something to generate dollars, you could do that. And everything that you collect, you're not taking it to the landfill. You're bringing it home because that's good stuff. And your pigs will start breaking it down. And then all their bacteria will start breaking it down. Before you know it, you'll be moving the pigs off to another nominal piece. And that'll be where the vegetable garden is because you'll have such good soil there. That's the way to do it. That's a way of doing two processes and getting something good that comes out of those two processes. Vertical integration. I'll take one more question and it's, it's time to call it a day. Uh, Why don't you ask me a question? I already asked. Uh, YouTube said that horse chestnuts are poisonous to humans and farm animals. They were brought from Europe for shade trees and there's not really anything good, so, I don't know. That's from YouTube. That's from YouTube? Yep, so. I'd still do it. I'd still do it. Um. The yeah. If the deer aren't eating them. But well, if that's the deer aren't eating them, that, that might be kind yeah. of a, a point. They're laying all over the ground everywhere. And but it's in town. There. She said it's in town. Well, she so said the... they're also all over the road, so I don't know. Huh. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know, you can. Oh, the trees are in town, but the things are everywhere. <laughs> you, I'm sure you could give them one and see what happens. And then the next day, if they're fine, give them two. But it seems to me those chestnuts would keep. And if you could get, you know, if you could put up several hundred pounds of them, you'd, but maybe if they're poisonous uh, in heavy quantities. I don't know, what did, what did, uh, you know, I, I heard that, Peach pits were poisonous to pigs, too. Or was it, it was cherry pits. You know, it was cherry pits. But one of our associates, close associates, he feeds them. And he, he didn't know that, you know, so he just fed them. And he's been doing it for years. So I remember I was buying potatoes from a potato farm. And I still would, too. I mean, that's a good legitimate source of, pro of feed. Um, and then I found out, oh no, you know, this is after I'm buying them for a couple of years. Then somebody, some, you know, keyboard ninja says, oh no, you'll poison your pigs. You will actually kill your pigs. You have to cook the potatoes first. And I said, well, for the last couple of years, I haven't been, and they're doing fine. Potatoes are actually kind of neat to feed to pigs, especially in a cold climate like this. Because if I bring them home, dump them out in a pile, 
they will freeze solid. So you have this, this like solid pill of feed and you throw it out to them. You know, they have stout jaws. They can break those up and eat them. All right, this was a, a good op. Uh, wow, 85 minutes, still raring to go. <laughs> Said she said she gave him a five-gallon bucket, and they're not dead yet, so I don't know. Who? who? Or, she did give him a five-gallon bucket? Oh, so you already did it? Yeah. You might go lightly, but... Wait a minute. Am I hearing this right? She already gave him... That's what she says in the chat. A five-gallon bucket, and... Yep. How long ago? She don't know. I, you don't know. not said yet. I don't okay. know. Oh, well then, that kind of dispels that rumor from YouTube. Well, Two weeks ago. This. Well, they're fine then. They're, it's good. You should be out there picking those things up and stowing them. I mean, they're going to, they'll keep a long time. And that's, that's a good source of protein right there. You know, a nut or fat. I would think they're definitely full of fat. All right. Well, I'm going to sign off. What everyone else thought. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. I don't know. From, from reading it, you can also make medicines out of it. And right at a glance, I'm not seeing what the difference would be. But Between horse chestnuts and just chestnuts? No. They are different. They're, they're different. But... What you would have to do to make it medicine. Apparently, you can treat hemorrhoids and a couple other things with it. But oh, really? You can also injure your kidneys and a couple other things. Have digestive issues. Okay. I don't know. I'd have to read up more. All right. Well, let's let's cut it off for now. We're at eighty-seven minutes. Appreciate everybody coming by. Uh, Tomorrow night, not exactly sure what's happening, Thursday night. Uh, I have to do a ton of preparation for Saturday, and I sure could use some help, Tatum, if you're still listening to us. But, um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll meet, and we'll see where it goes. I really don't know what we're going to talk about. We'll, let's see what happens in the news tomorrow. Okay. Anyone confirm?